This podcast is brought to you by Tor Books. Read The Living Dead by George A. Romero and Daniel Krauss. On sale now, wherever books are sold. When George Romero passed away in 2017, New York Times bestselling author Daniel Krauss finished the father of zombie horror's final zombie work. Set in the present day, The Living Dead is an entirely new tale, the story of the zombie plague as George A. Romero wanted to tell it. Joe Hill calls The Living Dead a horror landmark and a work of gory genius. Excelsior, true believers! You are about to embark upon a journey, a trip to the 70s and 80s, when mighty Marvel Comics ruled over all. The Defenders, Doctor Strange, the Champions, Deathlock, the Submariner, the Incredible Hulk, Killraven, the Son of Satan, the Macabre Man-Thing, and all your other Bronze Age favorites every week, appearing on Defenders Dialogue. Now here are your guides, Christopher Golden and Brian Keane. And welcome back once again, True Believers, to Defenders Dialogue. Excelsior indeed, Brian Keane here with you solo this week. Both Christopher Golden and engineer Matt Wolderson are on vacation. And because of that, we're going to pause in our coverage of Steve Gerber's Man Thing, except that we're not really. Uh, last week, Chris and I, of course, wrapped up our run of Adventure into Fear featuring the Man Thing. Uh, next week, we're going to be starting Steve Gerber's run on the Man Thing solo title. Uh, but in between, as we mentioned, we were going to cover two issues of Monsters Unleashed, issues number eight and issues number nine. Uh, which are singular and interesting in that they include a Steve Gerber man thing story, but they are not in comic book form. They are, in fact, prose fiction. It's a short story. Um, what I find interesting about them, as both a professional writer and a Steve Gerber fan, is that Gerber was much better at being a, a comic book writer than he was a prose writer, at least at, at this stage, when these were written in the early 70s. Uh, the prose is at times purple. Uh, you know, there, there are several things like uh, repeating a character's full name rather than their first name. Just a lot of uh, mistakes that you see any beginning writer making, myself included. Uh, it's interesting to see Steve Gerber making those in the pages of a Marvel comic. Now, Monsters Unleashed was a big black and white magazine. Um, and it's notable because it, it featured early appearances, not only by the man thing, by, by other Marvel horror characters, such as Werewolf by Night, Monster of Frankenstein, the Wendigo, many more. Uh, but as I said, today we're going to focus on issues eight, issues nine, Steve Gerber, a prose man thing story called Several Meaningless Deaths. Christopher Dale glanced down at his typewriter, then at his wristwatch. In the past 57 minutes, he had written only one sentence, and that sentence disturbed him. It made no sense, yet there was something unmistakably evil in its tone. It read, Let me tell you of me, so you will know what a nothing being is. What the hell did that mean? He felt uncomfortable, as if he had typed it with his fingers, but not his mind. Christopher Dale was suddenly fearful for his sanity. He pushed the rickety old straight-back chair on which he was seated back from the rickety old kitchen table on which his Smith Corona sat, and he stood up and stretched. Rather, he went through the motions of stretching. His muscles refused to respond, growing more tense in spite of his effort to relax. Except for the high-intensity lamp which beamed down upon and glared annoyingly back from the paper in his typewriter, the room was cloaked in darkness and in silence. It had been days since he had heard another human voice. He was alone, all alone, in this cramped, shadowy, one-room shack with the creaky floorboards and the chipping paint and the rusting window screens, all alone, in the middle of the Florida Everglades. 
He had rented the shack to achieve precisely that, isolation, freedom from the smog, the concrete, the crowding, the day-to-day brutalizing effect of life in New York City. And two, he had believed that he required solitude for his work, his writing. Somewhere deep in his gut, there was a novel he was trying to retch up through his fingers out onto the typewriter keyboard, but it wouldn't come. He'd thus far produced half a dozen false starts, each approximately 60 double-spaced type pages in length, each painfully shallow and therefore profoundly depressing to Christopher. Creative Dry Heaves He tried to yawn, failed, and shrugged his shoulders, shuffling out onto the ramshackle porch of the old shack. There he stood leaning on the splintery rail, looking out upon the expanse of marshland eerily illuminated before him in the silver-blue moonlight. Out here, there were almost too many sounds. Crickets, leaves and branches rustling in the warm evening breeze, the croaking of frogs, the sloshing and splashing of innumerable other anonymous denizens of the swamp. And on some nights, there was another sound, a very different sound. Thwash, thwash, thwash. Christopher Dale had never heard anything quite like it anywhere else. It seemed to be the rhythmic rise and fall of monstrous feet sinking deep into the swamp's muddy floor, then pulling themselves up with an accompanying rush of water and murk. Dale had spent many a night wondering what kind of creature it was that could possibly make such a hideous sound. The differing intervals between the sounds suggested an asymmetrical form, one leg longer than the other, the creature's center of gravity badly misplaced, a shambling, stumbling, awkward, yet immensely powerful man? No, it couldn't be a man, but it surely resembled a man, at least vaguely. Perhaps it was the swamp-dwelling monster he'd read about, the walking slime heap that supposedly haunted the Everglades, that Floridian version of the Loch Ness myth, the man-thing. Or then again, Maybe it was a malformed orangutan recently escaped from its evil-eyed kidnappers. He accorded the two possibilities roughly equal weight. He wasn't quite prepared yet to believe in swamp things that went thwash in the night. Christopher Dale made another attempt at yawning, but he wasn't tired, not physically at any rate, and he knew it. So he pivoted and walked back inside, closing the door behind him. He was wishing now that he had brought along a radio. Perhaps on his next trip into Citrusville, he would buy one. If nothing else, his experience out here had taught him that Marshall McLuhan was right. 20th century man could no longer endure privacy. The days of the individual alone in his tiny cubicle were over. Electronic media were an extension of the human nervous system. And to be cut off from them was like losing touch with a portion of the brain. Only in this case, it was the collective cultural brain or something like that. Christopher Dale lay down on the bed and wished that Elaine were here with him. But Elaine would never be with him again. That was the other reason he'd come to this godforsaken wilderness. He could have understood if Elaine had found someone more desirable than he. He was even able to admit to himself that it wouldn't have been very difficult. He wasn't handsome, too thin, too tall, eyes a little too far apart. He had a pleasant smile, though, and women were always attracted to his hair. It was golden, the color of cornbread, gleaming and fine and soft to the touch. But even less attractive than his physical traits was his profession, or lack of same. He was a writer in New York, with not a single publishing credit to his name, a fugitive from a public relations firm, totally undesirable, only a woman of means could afford to keep him. No, it would have come as no great surprise if Elaine had suddenly decided that she could do better. Odd that wasn't what happened. What happened was Elaine got killed. The oily little man was waiting in the lobby of her apartment building, waiting with his lousy little shiv crouching behind a potted plant. A potted plant! A freaking rubber tree! The watchman was off on a drunk, and Elaine had 50 bucks in her purse, all that was left of her salary after the rent had been paid, and the oily little man leaped from behind the rubber tree and grabbed her purse, only she wouldn't let go, and they played tug-of-war with the purse strap until Elaine started to scream and the drunk watchman came running and the oily little man, taking note of the terrible danger the watchman posed, shoved the knife into Elaine's stomach and pulled it out again along with her guts. And she died, instantly. And the oily little man got away because the watchman was too drunk to identify him. When Christopher Dale learned Elaine was dead, he couldn't even cry because his brain went numb. 
Elaine's friends called him insensitive. Two weeks later, he was on a bus headed south. Nowhere in particular, just south, because it was warmer than north. For a while, he drifted from town to town, staying in cheap hotels, surviving on cheese sandwiches and an occasional McDonald's hamburger, odd jobs in exchange for a room when he ran out of cash. Then he'd come to Citrusville, and in the classified section, he'd spotted the ad for this place. The rent was insanely low. The realtor had been unable to find a leaser for more than two years, he learned later, because of the previous tenant, a government scientist who disappeared mysteriously from the premises, presumably a victim of the alleged monster. And there had been a murder here, too, something to do with international espionage, no less. Murders, murders everywhere. But it afforded the solitude he was seeking, so he snapped it up three months ago, and he'd been here ever since, except for occasional excursions into town for supplies. Hello? Christopher Dale leaped from the bed to his feet at the sound of the voice. Had it actually been a voice? Is anyone there? Young, female, outside his door, calling to him from a little distance away. Why hadn't she just knocked? He raced to the door, flung it open almost melodramatically. More international spies? No. A brown-haired, green-eyed, sweet-faced girl, perhaps 16 years old, alone, looking up at him from the spot some three or four yards from the end of the porch where the earth fell away into the mud of the swamp. She was on her hands and knees. No, only one knee. She was dragging the left leg behind her. Small wonder, a deep gash in her left thigh was spewing blood into the tepid waters. As he watched, stunned, she raised a hand, waved to him. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Mister, will you help me, please? Before Christopher Dale could reply, her head hit the ground, and she passed into unconsciousness. She remained in that state for almost an hour, during which time Christopher Dale brought her inside, tended her wound, and tried to make her comfortable on the bed. He was across the room, boiling water for coffee when she awoke, screaming. He whirled and almost tripped over his own feet. She was sitting straight up, eyes wide, staring directly ahead of her, the palms of her hands pressed tight against her ears. He grabbed her wrists, yanked them away from her head, and shouted directly into her now uncovered ear, It's all right! Everything's all right! You've got to relax! Relax? With a strange man gripping her wrists and bellowing at her? Not likely, he reasoned. So he released her hands. They dropped limply to her sides and lowered his voice. He put his arms around her, held her close, and gently rocked her. She stopped screaming and started sobbing. But it was a step down from hysteria. He'd managed that much, at least. <sighs> I apologize for that sniffle, ladies and gentlemen. I am fighting allergies as I read this. Okay, kid, okay, you're all right. Nobody's going to hurt you here, he whispered. Lord, that was corny, he thought. But what else does one say in a situation like this? She seemed to regain her composure. The sobs now alternated with sniffles. He decided to try a question, the only one that mattered. What happened? She didn't answer. Instead, she pulled away from him, lay back on the bed, rolled over, and buried her face in the pillows. She mumbled something, but between the sobs and the sniffles and the pillows, it was lost. He tried again. What's your name? Who hurt you? Was it an accident? He heard her draw in a deep breath. She sat up and looked him straight in the eye, and she said, Let me tell you of me, so you will know what a nothing being is. Christopher Dale's jaw dropped. He sat gaping stupidly at her, unable even to shake his head in disbelief. She had just spoken word for word the mysterious sentence he had written more than two hours ago, a sentence no other human being had ever seen. What? She blinked at him as if just awakening. Huh? Did I say something? Her eyes were coming to life now. She looked closely at him as though seeing him for the first time. Until that moment, he'd been merely a presence to her, a featureless shape. He gazed deep into her eyes, too, searching for some sign of fakery, but there wasn't any. She had spoken the words the same way he'd written them, without conscious thought. He shoved the matter aside for the moment. If it meant anything, it meant they were both involved in something they didn't understand. What's your name? he asked, smiling at her. Elaine, she said, and to keep from gaping at her again, what's yours? Christopher, Christopher Dale. What are you doing here? Who sent you? He was getting angry. 
The girl seemed innocent enough, but somehow the whole affair had all the trappings of a cruel, practical joke. Elaine, indeed? No one sent me, she said defensively. Whatever gave you an idea like that? What do you think this is, anyway? What do you think I am? I don't know. What are you? She looked as if his remark had hurt her. Time for another revision of judgment, he thought. This was no joke. Or if it were, she was surely going to cop an Oscar for this performance. How did you hurt yourself? I didn't hurt myself. A man hurt me, tried to kill me, but I broke away. He slashed my leg with a knife. What man? Me. The voice came from behind. He whirled, framed in the doorway, his blade glinting in the moonlight, stood a giant of a man, and only the flimsy screen door stood between him and his prey. A moment later, even that minor obstacle was removed. The huge man lifted a leg and sent it crashing through the door's thin wooden frame. Then, slowly, the knife extended at arm's length in front of him. He stepped into the shack. Christopher Dale almost laughed. This couldn't really be happening, he told himself. Not out here, not in the middle of the Florida Everglades. All the savages were in New York. Get up, the big man growled at the girl. We're going home. The girl clung to Christopher Dale's arm. Now, are you coming or ain't you? Because if you ain't, I'm going to kill you and lover boy right here and now. Now, wait a minute, mister. I don't know who you are, but I'm this little tramp's father, that's who. And if you'd been any kind of proper kind of man, instead of low, crawling, skinny little worm, you'd have known a long time ago. You would have asked. You would have come and met me before you raped my daughter. Okay, that was shock number three. First, the sentence. Then, the name Elaine. Now, rape. Rape? Who was this madman? Elaine's father? Listen, friend, Dale said, fighting a lump in his throat. I've never seen this girl, your daughter, before tonight. I met her an hour ago outside this happy little hovel of mine where she was bleeding to death. He tried to see the big man's face, but it was hidden in shadow. Still, he felt a definitive change in the vibes he was getting from him, a change that was confirmed when the man warily lowered his blade. Then you ain't this guy Ted she's been seeing? The girl spoke up. His name's Christopher Dale, pa. He's telling the truth. I swear. Don't hurt him. How do I know you're telling the truth? How do I know he ain't Salas? Dale started. Ted Salas? You're hunting for Ted Salas? That's what she said his name were. Now Dale was laughing. Fella, you're hunting your daughter's fantasies. Ted Salas is a dead man. He rented this place two years ago, and the guy who owns this place told me he was murdered by the man thing. Thwash, thwash, thwash. The sound. Dale couldn't have asked for better timing. Hear that? It's the monster. He comes back to the scene of the killing every night. He's coming here now. You're lying, the big man roared. How come it ain't hurt you then? Why should it? I've never done anything to it. Salas used to shoot at it to drive it away. Otherwise, the monster wouldn't have bothered him either. Christopher Dale was feeling a renewed faith in his prowess as a creator of fiction. He really had unnerved this big knife-wielding slob. He thought he detected the big man's hand trembling, but it was too dark to be certain. He only hoped the girl's father was likewise unable to see clearly, for a smug, sardonic grin was working its way across his lips uncontrollably. You better get out of here, Dale said, before the thing comes after you. He doesn't like weapons of any kind. If he spots that knife, you're a goner. The big man glanced back toward the doorway. He could see a dark, ugly shape moving in the brush. Thwash, thwash, thwash. He was frightened. Even in shadow, it was possible to see his hand shaking. But he was also determined to take his daughter back where she belonged. And Dale had not counted on that. The big man lunged at them, crying, Liar! Elaine reacted instantly, letting go of Dale's arm and rolling off the bed, out of her father's reach. Dale was not so speedy. The knife sliced through his shirt sleeve, and he felt its edge tearing into the flesh of his right arm. It was only after the pain of the deep cut had reached his consciousness that he threw himself onto the floor, away from the bed, and the hate-maddened father. The sound was growing louder, more distinct, though at the moment Dale wondered why he was bothering to listen. He could see the big man's face now. It was terribly ugly, scarred, but the scars looked more like the cumulative result of innumerable beatings than that of a single violent incident. 
It looked as if the man's features were pounded out of shape, as if there were curves where angles should be and vice versa. His nose had obviously been broken at least twice. Cauliflower ears, what teeth he had were rotted. But from the neck down, he was solid, a wall of bone and muscle. The big man pulled his knife out from the mattress, raising it high over his head, and Dale struggled to his feet. It was a butcher knife. There was no subtlety about this character. You're Salas. I know you are. You've been lying to me. I'm going to kill you both and won't nobody in Topeka blame me for it. From what little Christopher Dale had heard of Topeka, Florida, the town on the opposite end of the swamp from Citrusville, he judged that the big man was probably right. Murder was acceptable in Topeka if the reason were good enough. It was the classic in the heat of the night southern town, which meant he was going to die unless he did something quickly. Elaine was hysterical. She sat on the floor by the bed, screaming, Ted! Ted! Come save me! Pa's going to kill me, Ted! The big man edged closer to Dale now, backing him toward the corner of the room. Thwash! Thwash! Good Lord, the thwasher had come up on land outside the cabin. It still dragged its feet across the muddy ground, but there was no longer the rush of the water. The knife was poised above the big man's head, and Dale was almost in a position for the kill. It would take a miracle to save him now. Ted! Ted! You came! Thank God! The big man's body blocked Christopher Dale's view of the doorway, so he could not know that his miracle had arrived on schedule. But he heard the odd thumping sounds of those clumsy feet as they moved across the room, and he saw the mottled, claw-like hand that fell on the big man's shoulder. And when that hand shoved against the big man's bull neck, sending him flying across the room, Christopher Dale gazed unbelieving at the hand's owner. Before him, stood a slump-shouldered beast, fully seven feet tall, whose misshapen body seemed to be composed entirely of foul-smelling, greenish-brown slime laced with lengths of root. From its round, mottled head, two crimson orbs peered out from beneath a root-like brow, and the creature's snout seemed to vanish into its chest in such a way to indicate that this monster could not breathe. Christopher Dale realized he had come face to face with the man-thing, what he didn't realize was that he had also come face to face with Ted, Sal Ted Salas. Okay, let's pause for a word from our sponsor, and then we'll pick it up on the other side. This podcast is brought to you by Tor Books. Read The Living Dead by George A. Romero and Daniel Krauss, on sale now wherever books are sold. When George Romero passed away in 2017, New York Times bestselling author Daniel Krauss finished the father of zombie horror's final zombie work. Set in the present day, The Living Dead is an entirely new tale, the story of the zombie plague as George A. Romero wanted to tell it. Joe Hill calls The Living Dead a horror landmark and a work of gory genius. Okay, so that was from Monsters Unleashed number eight. Uh, the story continues in Monsters Unleashed number nine. Now, the excerpt that I read is fair use. Uh, obviously, we don't want to, uh, you know, use the entire story here because that wouldn't be right to Steve Gerber's estate, to his heirs, or to Steve Gerber himself. Uh, you know, as a fan, as a fellow creative, I'm not going to read the entire story. Uh, but I, I can tell you that what happens is there, you know, it, it turns out, uh, there's sort of a, a synchronicity, you know, weird coincidences in the girl's name and the writing. And then of course there is a supernatural twist. And of course the man thing does save Christopher Dale because whatever knows fear burns at the man thing's touch. Uh, what I do want to talk about though, you know, as I said, there's some wonky sentence structure. Uh, you know, the, the repetition of the main character's first and last name, beginning writer mistakes. Um, but you also see a lot of what Steve Gerber would go on to do in his comics. You see it at work there in that prose, the social issues, uh, the commentary, the focus on even the antagonists have a reason for doing what they're doing. 
Um, it's also very autobiographical. If you know anything about Steve Gerber, uh, he was Christopher Dale. The hair was different, uh, but the body type he describes was right. The the job he had uh, was was spot on. You know, Steve Gerber also worked for an ad agency, and he hated it. He hated it. He wanted to be a writer. You know, and then he got a gig uh, to come to New York City and work at Marvel Comics. So he did. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, but, you know, it's it's a real interesting look at the, the development of a writer. Um, as I said, you see themes and, and even word choices and word patterns present in the prose that Steve Gerber would go on to repeat. Not only in Man Thing, but in The Defenders and in Omega and in Howard the Duck and Morbius and all the other stuff he did for Marvel in the 70s. Um, I should also note that uh, the two-parter is accompanied by illustrations. It's Again, it's not a comic. It's a short story. But there are, you know, uh, illustrations uh, by Pat Broderick and Al Milgram. Um are some really gorgeous, you know, just uh, thematic overall illustrations. Um, so, you know, I don't know if Marvel has collected Monsters Unleashed. Uh, you know, Chris and I talked, the, the Gerber prose story is not in the Steve Gerber man thing collections uh, that Marvel has put out. Um, so if you're at all into buying back issues, it may be worth tracking those two down. Uh, just so you can experience this, and obviously so you can read the conclusion of the story yourself. So that is it for this week. Uh, next week, Chris will be back, Engineer Matt will be back, and we will delve into Man-Thing, issue number one, which picks up with that cliffhanger where Adventure into Fear ended. Um, in the meantime, if you enjoyed the show, there's some other podcasts. You might enjoy The Horror Show with Brian Keene. Cosmic Shenanigans with Mary San Giovanni or Grindcast with Matt Wilson. All of those are available wherever you listen to Defenders Dialogue. They're also all available on Brian Keene Radio, which plays 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It plays an eclectic mix of music as well as all of those podcasts. Um, for more information about this show or any of the other shows, if you want to be an advertiser, if you want to listen to Brian Keene Radio, if you want to listen to, you know, back episodes of Defenders Dialogue, just go to briankeen.com. That's Brian, B-R-I-A-N, Keen, K-E-E-N-E.com. Click podcasts slash radio. All the information is there. And again, if you enjoy the show, maybe help out our engineer, Matt Wilderson. You can do that by listening to Grindcast, but even better, you can do that by buying one of Matt's books and supporting him financially, uh, just go to Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com, wherever you buy your books. Type Matt Wildeson, W-I-L-D-A-S-I-N, um, and you will see his books pop up. Uh, he's got a new one out right now, folks, just released. Uh, so please support him. He works hard on making Chris and I sound good every week. All right. And with that, we are done. Excelsior, true believers. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. This podcast is brought to you by Tor Books. Read The Living Dead by George A. Romero and Daniel Krauss. On sale now, wherever books are sold. When George Romero passed away in 2017, New York Times bestselling author Daniel Krauss finished the father of zombie horror's final zombie work. Set in the present day, The Living Dead is an entirely new tale, the story of the zombie plague as George A. Romero wanted to tell it. Joe Hill calls The Living Dead a horror landmark and a work of gory genius. Defenders Dialogue is a production of the Brian Keene Radio Network. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. 
Defenders Dialogue is written and produced by Brian Keene and Christopher Golden. Our theme music is by Xander Harris. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. If you enjoyed this show, you might enjoy our other podcasts, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, Cosmic Shenanigans, and Grindcast. To advertise on Defenders Dialogue, visit briankeen.com and click Podcasts.